Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to another Sunday morning. <laughs> Good to see everyone made it here, even though the roads are getting a little bit snowy again. <laughs> so I'm going to open the worship service this morning with a song that just really proclaims the gospel well. I hope some people know it, but <laughs> I just really wanted to sing it today. So if you could join me in standing as we sing, it'd be great. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come, all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you look. His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. For God so loved the world that He gave us. His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us, whoever believes in him. walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God. From whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us. For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him will live forever. The 
power of hell forever defeated now it is well i'm walking in freedom for god so loved god so loved the world bring all your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god so loved the world My shame is and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence lord your presence
Lord God, we thank you for this morning that we can come together into your presence. And we do pray that as we, as we gather together as your people, that your spirit would meet with us. Lord, I pray for your people today. Where we may need comfort, we, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would be that spirit of consolation. Where, Lord, we may need challenge or we may need you to speak into our lives. And I pray, Lord, that you, the spirit who is the comforter, the consoler, the exhorter, will have a place in our midst to speak within our heart. Lord, with whatever people are coming with this week. Lord, for with whatever those who are joining with us online are experiencing this week. I ask, Lord, that your spirit meet with us and that we worship you. You are our God. You are our King. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you to Alex for leading us with worship through music this morning. Uh, just before we go on with our service, I invite you to turn around and holler a greeting to somebody and see who you're worshiping with. And greetings to those who are joining us online and invite you to say hi as well. And I'll let you be seated just for a few moments. I'm sure Alex will have you standing again shortly enough. <laughs> you have your bulletins. If you don't have your bulletin, um, there are a few in the foyer still, or if you're joining us online, our bulletins can be found at fortmcleodalliancechurch.com. We have uh, our bulletins online, plus we have information for those of you who worship through, uh, through giving. Uh, we have information for that both online and uh, in the bulletins as well for our online options. Um, as well, there is a box at the back for that. Uh, just a few items from the bulletin. Uh, first off is I will be away this following week. I'm gone to district conference. Uh, or I'm sorry, I've gone to our district prayer retreat, um, plus a few days of holidays as well. So next Sunday, one of our elders, Brent Perse, will be uh, speaking. Uh, if you have any concerns or needs that come up during the week, please contact the church office uh, and, uh, and, and talk to Purdy or contact one of our church elders. And uh, if they need to, they will, uh, they will get away with, get, get a hold of me. They know how to track me down. But uh, that's just if you're looking for me this week, I will be away. Um, Operation Christmas Child, if you haven't picked up a shoebox yet, they are in, in the back foyer there. And so... Uh, encourage you to take part in that. Uh, our drop-off deadline is November 22nd, and the information for that is in the bulletin. Uh, most of the other things you can read, uh, Nursery and Discovery Land, that is going to be starting up today. So just before the sermon, uh, we will be dismissing the kids that are age 3 to grade 3 uh, to go downstairs for their time of Discovery Land. Uh, for those in, age, in grades four and five, we are working on uh, a DIY program, a discipleship and youth program for that. And so the youth leaders are, 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 and Discovery Land leaders are working on that, and they will be announcing that uh, in the not too distant future. But for today, just before the sermon, we will be praying for and dismissing the uh, kids age three to grade three to go downstairs for Discovery Land. Uh, youth DIY is set for Tuesday night. Uh, you see Blast and Men's Ministry in there. Uh, there's a membership update in the bulletin as well. Uh, one last announcement was sent to me this morning is next Sunday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, an open church prayer meeting that will be held here at the uh, church, probably upstairs in the fellowship hall. So uh, that is uh, next Sunday evening at uh, 7 o'clock. So um, that is the announcements of the things that are going on in the life of our church. We gather here to meet to worship, but really it's our interactions through the week is when we do church. So uh, this isn't doing church, this is gathering to worship. But as you fellowship together, as you connect with one another, as you pray for one another, find ways to minister to one another, that is the place that, that we do church. But uh, Let us continue on with worship through music. Please stand with me again. <laughs> Too long on my own. 
presence created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. And I see you now laying it down. Know that I need you. I run to the Father. No reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon Soul needs a friend So I'll run to the Father Again and again And again and again Son for redemption, the price for my heart. I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. I run to the Father to grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. been in your sight long before my first breath running into your arms is running from life to life from death and i feel this rush deep in my chest mercy is calling out just as i am you pull me in and I know that I need you I run to the Father fall into grace I'm done with the hiding no reason to wait my heart needs a surgeon my soul needs a friend so I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again oh
Morning, everyone. Okay. First of all, I'm going to read uh, Psalm 19. So if you have your Bible, you can certainly look it up. I think I'll just read it off the wall. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out to all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched his tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, more, much more than gold. They are sweeter than honey, honey from the honeycomb. Let's pray. Thanks for being able, Lord, we just thank you for being able to gather here in your house, in safety. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer, as the psalm says. Lord, we ask that you bring healing to those who are gathered here, spiritual, physical, mental, those that are gathered at home likewise. Blessed, bless the new <coughs> council in uh, our town, and in the towns around the province as well. Let them do your will and be a blessing to you. We ask that you bless our church as well. Let it grow and become a beacon of hope for our congregation and all the people of the town and surrounding area. We ask that you bless Pastor Kevin as he's away this week. We ask that you give him rest and renewal and that the words he speaks today are your words to us. Lord, we 
your word seems to be gaining strength in our churches. As we are caught up in the... Sorry, we just ask the, that the leadership of this church and those heading into the those heading up the ministries, especially the children's ministries, receive a blessing as well. Bless those who are watching at this service at home. Thank you for the moisture we received. Even if it's snow, it'll help to revive the soil come spring. We ask, Lord, that you can the gospel continue to go into areas of the world where it is not heard. Let those who bring it be bold as many fear for their lives. Lord, we ask your hand in all those who have claimed they know you, but now they are claiming that it is all that it was all an act. And this word exvangelicals is becoming the new buzzword in many of our churches. Lord, we just ask that nobody that no one gets caught up in this and of also in the lies of the anti-God beliefs of, this, of, of socialism, which is rearing its ugly head in so many governments and agencies. Let those proclaiming it see the truth of your word and denounce what they are teaching. Lord, we love you. We ask that you continue to strengthen us by your word. May our actions and things we say in our daily lives be a beacon of light to those that do not know you and draw them to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Thank you all for singing with me. You can sit now. <laughs> Let's pray together. For we dismiss the kids to their discovery land. We want to pray. And Lord God, we thank you for the children in our church. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us to steward that which is so precious in your sight. And I pray, Lord, for the teachers. I pray for the time the kids spend together um, with them, that they would see something of you, that their experiences with these teachers and in Discovery Land would be such that that would cause them to look at you um, in a way that, that leads them to be children of praise. Bless the kids in our church, Lord, as they head out to this, their time now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are age three to grade three, we would invite you to follow the Discovery Land leaders as they head down to, uh, to your time for that. So we're continuing on this morning with our series of Being Christian, and we've been looking at seeing our lives lived out with an ever-growing alignment to the character of Christ. We've been looking in many aspects at the attributes of God, at least those that we would describe as those communicable attributes, those those attributes that are passed on from God to us in how they are expressed through our lives. Not so much about our self-declarations, but how our Christian identity and character is experienced by those who do life with us um, before they even hear our allegiance to Jesus. Is what comes through our lives something that causes others to think Jesus? to consider us as a Christ follower before we even say it. That's what we've been looking at as we've been looking at being Christian. And part of the outline for the series comes from a book by Pastor Darren Ride called The DNA of a Christ Follower, Eight Essential Traits. And I'm using his chapter headings roughly as, as, as the guideline um, for the series and some of the thoughts that you're hearing are influenced by the readings of that book as well. So far, we've looked at being a lover of God. We've looked at being a lover of people. We've looked at being holy. In essence, being different in a way that points to God. This morning, we're going to be looking at being truth-based. And as we continue on in the series, we're going to be looking at how being Christian is being mission-focused. And being Christian means persevering, being God-dependent, and being people who are focused on eternity. Now, the last time we gathered, we looked at being holy. Kind of a scary word, and I'm sort of uh, continuing on, really, from some of the thoughts in that sermon two weeks ago. 
Being holy is about our ever-growing alignment with the character of God. This is who God is. This is the nature of God, and we continue to grow in an alignment with Him. We are created in the image of God, but sin has marred that image. And the transformative work of the Spirit within us seeks for that image to be restored in our lives as it was intended to be. Sometimes we point to Galatians 5.22 and we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. One of the interesting things about that passage is the word fruit there is singular. The word fruit there in the Greek language is singular. It's not the fruits of the Spirit where love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, patience, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. They're not all separate fruits where they're developed individually within our lives. Rather, the passage speaks about one fruit, one fruit of the Spirit that has a blend of flavors. And that fruit of the Spirit with its blending of flavors together is an expression of holiness, is an expression of the character of God, are the transferable attributes of the character of God that begin to be formed in our lives when we begin to be aligned towards that which is holy. We were in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. And where we finished off, I want to pick, off, pick up where we finished off a couple of weeks ago, as it is a call to holiness, a call for us to be different, different in a good way, different that reflects the character and the attributes of God. But I want you to notice something in this, and this is where I want to pick up from. It has something to do with our minds. Our growing alignment with the holiness of God, has something to do with our minds. See what it says to begin with. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Prepare your minds, and it's contrasted in this passage with do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. You have a before and an after picture that is taking place in this passage that is somehow connected with preparing your minds for action. The verse itself is reminiscent of other passages of Scripture. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we read this, Do not be conformed to this world. You know the rest of the verse. But be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. There is something that happens in that we are not conformed. There is a transformation, a change that is taking place from our alignment with the world, with our alignment with the kingdom of God and the character of God, and that has something to do with the renewing of our minds. Colossians chapter 3, we read this, set your minds on things that are above, not on things of the earth. Philippians 2.5, have this mind among you, or I like the King James Version for this, have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Really? No, that's not what we're told. We're told we're all good inside. Well, part of our Christian worldview, part of our understanding of the teaching of God is that God created us as good. We're created in the image of God, but sin has corrupted that image. We do not naturally lean towards holiness. We do not naturally lead towards the character of God in our lives. We lead, we lead naturally towards deceitful desires. That is what the scriptures tell us. That is why the argument that comes up between environment, am I merely, is, is the dysfunctions in my life merely a product of my environment, the way I was raised, where I was raised? I, no argument. There's, there's a contribution that our environment makes to us. But you can grow up in the perfect environment. 
and say no to God. Ephesians 4.22, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and see the next part, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. God is seeking for us. We, In being Christian, we are being holy. We are, our lives are being moved into a greater alignment with God. It's taking place in part through a renewing of the spirit of our minds and a new self is put on where we are created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. I hope you see the connection this morning. I hope you see the connection. If we are being Christian, if we are being Christian, if we are to be holy, to be different and aligned with God, there is something that needs to happen with our minds. If we are to be holy, if we are to be aligned with the character of God in our lives, there is something that needs to happen to our minds. Our thinking, our basis of discernment regarding what is in alignment with the kingdom of God and what is not. There is a change in the way we think when we become Christians. There is a change in the way we think that shifts our worldview. That's the lens through which we interpret life. There is a change in the way we think that shifts our worldview to be consistent with the mind of God. All of this to say this, you cannot be a Christian and expect that the way you think will stay the same. You cannot be Christian and expect that the way you think, the way your mind works, the way you interpret the world around you, will be the same. You will think differently in Christ. You will think differently in Christ. Being Christian is being renewed in our minds. Dear people, I want you to understand there is a spiritual battle that is taking place. There is a spiritual battle that is taking place regarding what and how we think and upon what is the basis of truth. There is a spiritual battle that is taking place regarding what you think and how you think and upon what is the basis of truth. We talk about spiritual warfare sometimes. And sometimes our concept of spiritual warfare is that it is a power encounter with spirits. Well, there are times when there may be power encounters, but at its root, spiritual warfare is a truth encounter. Spiritual warfare is first and foremost a truth encounter. It began in the garden with the serpent asking Eve, did God actually say? This was the start of spiritual warfare. Adam and Eve in the perfect environment. Did God actually say? Questioning the truth of God, and that continues, that warfare continues to the present. But now, of course, as you're sitting here, you may say, but that's a loaded word when you use the word truth. That's a loaded word. I mean, after all, you, if you pastor, you're talking about truth. Whose truth are you talking about? Whose truth are you talking about? I'm living my truth. Isn't that the mantra of our day? I'm living my truth. Whose truth are you talking about? Even Pilate looked at Jesus and said, what is truth? And I actually think the title for the message this morning is the wrong message. The title of the message that I gave to Purdy earlier in this week was being a truth seeker. And that's really not the message that I want to come out with. I don't want us to be truth seekers. Rather, I think the title should be being Christian is being truth based. Because I would suggest this morning that for us as Christian, it is less about seeking truth. It is less about looking to find truth as if it's somewhere out there than it is with coming to terms with the truth that we have already been given. Being Christian is being truth-based around the Lord Jesus Christ and around the Word of God. John chapter 17, verse 17, the Lord Jesus is praying 
for his disciples. He's praying for the church that would fall. He is praying for you. And the Lord Jesus praying to the Father says this, sanctify them. Now, you remember a couple of weeks ago, the word sanctify and the word holiness are part of the same word groups in Scripture. When you see the word sanctify in Scripture and you see the word holy, they are related to one another. What Jesus is saying, sanctify them. What Jesus is saying is make them holy. Make their lives aligned. Make their attitudes, their values, their behavior, make them to be aligned with who God is, with who you are as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus prays, he says, sanctify them. Make them holy. What does he say? Sanctify them in the truth. And then he says this, your word is truth. Your word is truth. Dear people, truth is less something we need to discover and more something that we need to access from what God has already given to us. And then once we begin to access it, the question is, what will we do with God's truth? John Maxwell once said this, he says, Christians today, he says, Christians know more about the Bible than they ever plan on obeying. Christians know more about the Bible than they ever plan on obeying. We do not need more food, we need more exercise. We have God's truth. We are such a blessed people. We have God's truth. The Bible isn't merely a reference book for us. Let's reference it to see some thoughts and ideas that might be helped. It's not a giant self-help book to give you and I a better life. The scriptures are the word of God. They speak the heart and the mind of God. And if we are to be sanctified in the truth, if we are to be people that are made holy, it is going to have something to do with how we connect with the word of truth. Pastor Dean Ride put it this way, being Christian is being truth-based. He says it means that your beliefs and your actions are founded upon the Bible. That is the, the question of authority is settled. The authority of God in our lives means that we accept the authority of the Word of God in our lives. Now understand, I'm not talking this morning about legitimate differences that we may have in seeking to understand what God says. There are theologians and there are schools of thought regarding looking at the scriptures and trying to understand. I mean, we don't all have the same, the same interpretations when it comes to end times theology or some of our ecclesiology or as far as how churches should function and work together. There are different things that we wrestle with in our understanding. But I'm asking the question this morning as to where do we as Christians look for the source of truth? I'm not talking about the question of wrestling with the scriptures and saying, God, I'm not sure I'm understanding everything you're saying here. But the question is, are we wrestling with the truth of the word of God? Is it our source of truth where we wrestle with understanding on how the world, on how life, on how death, on how eternity, on right and wrong and so forth? Not did God really say, but this is what God said, and now I have to do the hard work of wrestling to understand it. In a culture of so many competing ideologies, in so many competing spiritualities, opinions and so forth, all competing all competing for airtime in our spirits? Will our values, our attitudes, and our actions revolve around wrestling with and incorporating the teachings of Scripture, the heart and the mind of God, or will they revolve around something else? I want to say it again this morning, dear people. We will not, <clears throat> we will not be Christian and still think the same. If sometimes that you find the way you think is out of sync with the world around you, it's supposed to be. We will not be Christian and still think the same. A huge part of discipleship 
revolves the reorientation of our minds. Again, Ephesians 4.22, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This only comes when we let the Spirit align our minds around the Word of God. Now, I said earlier that spiritual warfare is far less a power encounter than a truth encounter. I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm looking at verses 3 to 5. So if you've got your Bibles or if it's on your phone or whichever, I don't want you just to hear it from me. I want you to actually see the words that are there. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 5. Paul is dealing in this part of the Scriptures, in this part of the New Testament, with false teachers and false apostles. That in itself is huge to our mindset today. That in itself says something powerful to us, to us when you realize the amount of space in the New Testament that is taken up with addressing false teachers. Not all teaching is equally the same. Not all teaching, not everything that's said in the name of God is equally the same. There is truth. And there is falsehood. There is that which is consistent with what God has said and who God is. That is true. And there is that out there that is not consistent with what God says and who God is. And that is falsehood. 2 Peter chapter 2, we read this. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Second Timothy, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Some of this is uncomfortable for us today because we like our pluralistic way of thinking. And we as Christians get caught up within the pluralism of the thinking of the world that we live in. All different spiritualities and opinions and concepts, and we don't want to say that something is true and something is false. Rather, we stick with this notion of, you have your truth and I have my truth. Until we have to wrestle with Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said this, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes this, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of of righteousness. If your picture of the devil is something that's, you know, some red creature with horns and a pitchfork, that's not the picture that the Scripture gives. Rather, Satan, as described in the Scriptures, like an angel of light, he's inviting. He's inviting. It sounds good. It sounds so close to truth. And his servants disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. You've heard me say it before, the power of a lie is this, you honestly believe it to be true. That's the power of a lie. I mean, if you told me something and it's not true, but I believe it to be true, I'm going to act on it. But if you tell me something that's not true and, and uh, I don't believe it's true, then it no longer has power. The power of a lie is when you tell me a falsehood, I believe it sincerely to be true. And sometimes we talk about sincere, sincerity when it comes to the concept of truth. And we forget the notion that when it comes to God, when it comes to the Word of God, you can be sincere, but you can also be sincerely wrong. There is truth and there is 
falsehood. Paul says this, but I am afraid that as the servant deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Did you catch that? Did you catch what the deception is seeking to do? The deception is seeking to lead us astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Leaves me with a question, does that mean I can have an impure devotion to Christ? Is such a thing possible? Is such a thing possible where I can have that? Perhaps because Paul goes on to say this, for if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one that we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one that you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. <clears throat> Paul is clear. There are sometimes people receive another Jesus that isn't Jesus at all. I want you to understand this this morning. And this may grate at you. I understand that because it's not the world that we live in. It's not the world we live in with the pluralism of ideologies that says you have your truth and I have my truth. And we as Christians, we get lulled into that as well. It sounds good, but did God actually say I want you to get this this morning. There is truth and there is falsehood. There is truth and there is falsehood. All teachings are not equal. With God, there is not your truth and my truth, but there is God's truth. And the battle for our mind is concerning aligning ourselves with the truth of God and God's word. Look at verse 3 to 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is a picture of spiritual warfare. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now look at verse 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. This is Paul's description of spiritual warfare. He says, we have, we have divine power for the pulling down of strongholds. And what is it that's being done when strongholds are being pour, pulled down? He says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. I want you to understand something. There's a little bit difference between, there's an inner and an outer battle with truth. These words were not written to the world. These words were written to the church. These words were written to the Corinthian church that had all kinds of trouble with how it had continued to integrate the world within its worship of God. So Paul is talking to the church. The reason I say that is sometimes we get the idea that we're supposed to go out into the world and we're to destroy arguments and take every thought captive and to destroy arguments and lofty opinions against the knowledge of God. And we do that, but not in that battle kind of a way. 1 Peter chapter 3, we read this, and you'll remember a few weeks ago, I said that the purpose of 1 Peter was holy, li holy living in a hostile world how you relate your faith within a hostile world. And Peter writes this, he says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. There are sometimes Christians go out in the world seeking to destroy the arguments of the world, but their behavior puts them to shame. You've heard me say before, you can be so wrong in the way that you are right. You can be so wrong in the way that you are right. 
Paul's not talking about that here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He's talking about spiritual warfare, and he's talking about your life and my life. The divine power to destroy arguments and lofty opinions that are within us that are raised against the knowledge of God. And why does that battle take place? So that every thought might be taken captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. We ask you this morning, what does a stronghold look like in someone's life? Paul says here that with divine power to destroy strongholds, what is a stronghold? Well, a stronghold is a defensible position. A stronghold would have been like the walls around a city or the walls around a fort. It gives a stronghold. It's a defensible position. In this case, the stronghold is not God's stronghold. The stronghold is the devil's stronghold. And the implication here is that in your life and in my life, there may exist strongholds. And what are they? They are deeply rooted deceptions. When you and I experience a stronghold in our life, what we have is we have this defensible walled fortress that is a deeply rooted deception, not easily removed, but it affects our attitudes, our values, and our behaviors as we relate to God, as we relate the world to the world around us, and even to ourselves. Lord, do I have? Are there strongholds in my own life? Are there strongholds that are deeply rooted deceptions in my own life that you want to use your divine power to replace deceptive strongholds with truths from God? That that truth would set me free. The Holy Spirit seeks to tear down deeply rooted deceptions in your life that interfere with the work of God within you. And that is key to discipleship. Key to discipleship is how God, the Spirit, through the Word, replaces the lies that we live by with the truth of God. If the devil and the demonic can get us to believe a lie and to act upon a lie, you will be, we become enslaved by a falsehood. Eve, did God actually say? Eve, did God actually say, let me introduce you to an alter alternative way of thinking. And what was the result? The result of Eve believing a lie and acting upon that lie was a damaging of relationship with God, was a damaging of relationship with others, was the introduction of shame, The feeling of the need to hide and the introduction of blame. These were things that took place when the devil got Eve to act on a lie. But I am afraid, Paul says, that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts, your thoughts as the people of God will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, you put up with it readily enough. Being Christian is learning to think as God thinks. Being Christian is learning to think what God thinks. And there's a lifetime of that. Being Christian is learning to think as God thinks, to experience a change in the way we think that shifts our worldview to be consistent with the mind of God. I want to tell you this morning, there is a battle going on for your mind. Not just somebody else's mind. There is a battle this morning that's going on for your mind. There is truth from God designed to tear down strongholds and falsehoods in your life and my life. And there is a need for us as God's people to grow in discernment regarding what we choose to believe as truth. But in order for that to take place, we need the right reference point for truth. We need the right reference point for truth. And for the Christian, the primary source of truth is the Word of God.
your word is true. I want to stretch us for a point. What do we mean when we say that the Bible is God's truth? I like the way Darren Ride puts it. He says this, but while the Bible doesn't contain all truth, all that it contains is true. Now, listen carefully because I hit a few trigger words in there and some of you will get your pitchforks out. While the Bible doesn't contain all truth, all that it contains is true. God communicates through special revelation. That's the scripture, the specific. God also communicates through general revelation. The Bible doesn't teach us about gravity. The Bible doesn't teach us about auto mechanics. The Bible doesn't teach us about the principles of flight or the pathophysiology of diseases. It doesn't teach us how to cook tur a turkey dinner. You won't find a divine recipe for that in the scriptures. There is truth, there is knowledge outside of the Bible. But all that the Bible does communicate on any and every topic or principle that it touches is truth. And without this, there is no foundation or reference point for responding to God's truth. Our statement of faith as a church speaks about the inerrancy of Scripture, that we believe that the Scriptures as they were originally given is inerrant. Now, yes, you saw the phrase originally given. All our translations are translated from a different language. And our language changes. And so sometimes when you read something in one translation, the English language has changed and there's a better way of communicating that in today's context, given our ever-changing languages. We believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. God's Word is true. There are no mistakes in it. We believe it to be God-breathed. God is the origin of it. For the, for the prophecies or the Scriptures came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God, the Scripture says, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We say that the Bible is verbally inspired. Now that's a theology term. What does that mean? It means that we believe that every word in it is true. Every word in it is true, as it was originally given. Jesus said this. He talked about the jot and the tittle, or the iota and the dot. He talked about the punctuation marks of Scripture. He says it talks about this in Matthew 5.18 saying that none of it will pass away. Every word of Scripture is true. Our, our statement of faith says this, they, the Old Testament and New Testament, constitute the divine and only rule of Christian faith and practice. This is our reference point, the Word of God. This is our reference point. This is where we get our worldview from. And I, I know you're sitting there going, this is old stuff, Pastor. I know this. I know this. But I think we mix so many other messages from the world in with the Word of God that at times we come away with something that is no longer the Word of God but has bits and pieces of it in there. And that leads us to being caught up in deceptions. The starting point for our worldview, God created and it was good. We are God's good creation, created to know and interact with God. Sin entered the world through man and woman acting in independence of God's design. God came up with a, well, he didn't come up, he planned from the beginning, a redemptive plan through Christ to restore this. The foundation for truth for us is the word of God. Without this, if you and I are only the result of random chance, natural or evolutionary forces, then tell me who is to say that Hitler was wrong? If we are only the result of random chance or evolution and forces, who is to say that Hitler was wrong? Who is to say genocide is wrong? Who is to say child molestation is wrong? Or any number of atrocities, moral or immoral positions are wrong? Who is to say that racism is wrong? Who is to say that taking advantage of the poor and downtrodden is wrong? Because without God as a reference point for truth, I want you to get this this morning. 
Without God as a reference point of truth, morality becomes the result of a majority social conscience. Without God as the reference point of truth, morality becomes the result of a majority social conscience. The majority moral conscience, the power of the majority, becomes the verdict and the defining of what is right and wrong. Now tell me what happens when the majority social conscience changes. How do you decide if that change is an improvement or not on what you had before? You tell me stealing is wrong? What if I disagree? If we are just random chemical and biological processes, then who are you to disagree? What is the reference point for truth? God or just random chemical and biological processes. If we are all just a result of the random development of life, moved along by mindless evolutionary forces and natural selection, if we are only just a result of a random development of life, moved along by mindless evolutionary forces and natural selection, rather than a creator God, then who are you to tell me what is right or wrong, and who are you to contradict? What is my truth? You see, going back to the scriptures and finding our worldview firmly in the scriptures, firmly in Genesis 1 to 3 to start with, is so important. I'm not here this morning to convince you about the divine nature and reliability of the Bible, why I believe the Bible. That's another sermon. I'm going with the assumption that most of you hold it as truth from God. What I am asking this morning is for us as Christians to once again be confronted with what is our reference point for truth. What is your reference point for truth? You may respond the Bible, and that's a good answer. But I want you to be aware of the battle for the mind your mind, and it is a battle for what constitutes truth. Dear people, we need to renew our sense of discernment with so many messages we are bombarded with each and every day. We need to saturate our minds with the Bible, with the heart and mind of God. Being Christian will affect the way that you think. The Holy Spirit will take the truth of God's word and seek to align your thinking, seek to renew your mind that you might think as God thinks. And if we do not fill our minds with the word of God, there is no reference point for the Holy Spirit to align our thinking towards. Lastly, I want to say this. It must not just be about knowing the truth, but it must be about doing the truth as well. It must not be about just knowing the truth, but doing the truth as well. If we are to be holy people, the way we think will change, and then the way we live will change. We must live the word if we are to be Christian in the way God intends. Let me ask you this morning, dear people, what is your reference point for truth? What is your re reference point for truth? How you make your decisions, how you decide what is moral and immoral, what is right, what is wrong. What is your reference point for discerning what ultimate reality is? Is it Facebook, celebrities, media, even family, school or higher education? Is it the moral majority, Mor morality is defined by the majority, or is it the word of God? Being Christian is being truth-based and growing to think as God thinks. What will it look like for us? What will it look like for you to think as God thinks? We cannot be Christian and expect to think the same. If you find that the way you think is just really the same way that the world thinks, in its values, and in its interpretations, then it just may be that there's a stronghold of deception in your life that needs to be removed. Ephesians 
to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Dear people, are there strongholds of deception within your Christian life that you need to let the Spirit and the Word begin to tear down? Give some thought to that. Ask God. The power of a lie is you think it's true. You don't think you're being deceived. But perhaps we need to ask God for a greater sense of discernment as we continue to immerse our minds in the Scriptures. Lord, are there strongholds of deception within your Christian life that need to let the Spirit and Word tear down? I've sometimes asked people, when's the last time God changed your mind? When's the last time that confronting, being confronted with the Scriptures actually changed the way you thought about something. If it never does, then chances are you're just bringing yourself to the Scriptures and making it say what you want, rather than saying, God, let your Word speak into me. Let it change the way I think. If being Christian is being truth-based and means a change of thinking, where might the Holy Spirit be seeking to change my thinking, to renew my mind, that I might think and then act more like God. stand with me as we close the service.
salvation in thy will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken and holy there is no one like you there is none besides you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Even as the Lord Jesus prayed that we would be sanctified, that we would be made holy in truth, and then said, your word is truth. Lord, I pray that you would work that out within us. You have blessed us with being able to experience the beauty of who you are. And Lord, in you, you seek for us to be aligned in heart and in mind with the beauty of who you are. I pray, Lord, in our lives, there may be places in all of our lives where there are strongholds of deception that are affecting our relationship with you, affecting our relationship with those around us, and Lord, you would wish to tear those down. Lord, I pray that if we, in being Christian, are to be people who are truth-based, Lord, may we be people who are founded upon your word. Let us wrestle with it, and let us listen for you. Shape the way we think, so that when the world looks at us, they would see you. Be glorified. Now, Lord, as we leave this place, Lord, we leave with your commissioning to go into the world that you have placed us to be light, to be you. In heart, in mind, in character, in value, in conviction, that the world may see the beauty of who you are and be drawn to you. Lord, send us with your blessing. Send us with your commission. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. As the Lord dismisses you, you are dismissed. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only great are you Your praise, our heart.